In this video, I want to show you how to measure superheat and subcooling, and that's it. Just how to measure it. I'm not going to go into how to troubleshoot it, how to diagnose it, what superheat and subcooling is, the science behind it, any of that. I'm simply going to show you how to measure it. Because I know when I started out as a tech, I mean, when I started, there wasn't as much stuff online, not as much info that you could look up. Um, nowadays, there's a ton of stuff you can look up on Google and YouTube. But when I just started out, I forgot oftentimes which one, how to measure superheat and subcooling, which one is the measurement for superheat and which one is the measurement for subcooling. So I'm gonna show you that real quick, explain how to measure it, and I'll also show you what I wrote on my gauges in the past, just as a reminder to myself. So the first thing you wanna do is of course hook your gauges up, the low side and the high side. The low side is the suction line, which is this blue hose, blue gauge. The high side is the red, which is the red hose and the red gauge. This is the discharge side. And I like to make sure that all my fittings are on there securely. That way when I put my hoses on, refrigerant is not spewing out if they're loose. So now they're all secure, we know that. I'll just hang this over here. Okay, so our suction line, or the blue hose, is always going to be the thicker copper line. So that's the one that's sucking refrigerant in, and our discharge is the one that's pushing refrigerant out. So I'll take the access caps off. Sometimes the O-ring stays on there. Pay attention to that. Take the O-ring off, slide it back into the cap. If it doesn't go back in there uh, neatly and flush, you might need to take a little screwdriver and just push it in there. And this one is missing an O-ring as well. Um, if there's no O-rings, the refrigerant could leak by a little bit if the Schrader valve is leaking. So optimally, you do wanna have O-rings inside of the caps. I'm gonna replace these after I'm done with brass caps that have the O-rings in them. And of course, when you're dealing with refrigerant, it's always a good idea to wear some gloves so if some of it is spurting out, it's not gonna frostbite your hands. I also have low loss fittings on my gauge set and that helps a lot with refrigerant not escaping. These thicker fittings right here. The hoses are a little bit more expensive, but I think it's well worth it. So let's put on our low side and our high side. I like to put my gauges on when the unit is off, but in order to measure the superheat and subcooling, we will need to have it running. So let's put the hoses on. Look at that, not even a spurt. That's why I love these low loss fittings. So that's the low side. Here's our high side. Just like that. Okay, so now I have both sides connected, and if the unit has been off for a while, the pressures should be equalized, and they are. So this is about 125 PSI on the low side, and it's about 125 PSI on the high side, which is good. When the unit is off, the pressures do need to be equalized. And one last thing you will need to take these measurements is a pipe clamp to measure the temperature, or if you have an infrared gun, that you could just aim at the pipe and shoot it that way. That's even easier. I left mine accidentally at somebody's house as a souvenir, so I'm back to using my pipe clamp, which works pretty well too. So I'll clamp this on my suction side to begin with. Leave it there. And then I'll put my temperature probe in my meter. Okay, so we're ready to get our reads. And before we get into that, let me just explain what I'm gonna be looking at when we turn this unit on. So I'll put my gauge here for now. So if we take a look at my gauge, my gauges, this is a R22 unit. So we're gonna be looking at the green scale right here. That's the R22 scale. We're not really gonna be looking at the PSI. So you do have to have a manifold gauge that has the refrigerant that your unit has. So in our case, the R22, the saturation temperature is this green scale right here. So to get our superheat reading, 
we're always going to use the low side or the suction side. So superheat is always going to be on the low side. Whereas the subcooling, you're always going to get that reading from the high side or from the red gauge. And we're going to be using the green scale on here as well. So basically to get the measurement of the superheat and subcooling, you're going to be doing the line set temperature minus the gauge temperature, or you're going to be doing the gauge temperature minus the line set temperature. And back in the day when I couldn't remember what's what, I used to write behind my gauges as a reminder to myself. I would write G minus L equals SC, which stands for gauge temperature. So the temp temperature on the gauge minus the line temperature. So gauge minus line will equal my sub cooling reading. And for the superheat, it would be L minus G equals SH. And that was like my little cheat sheet. So on this one, it's line temperature minus gauge temperature equals superheat. So that's an easy way to remember it. Or if you struggle remembering it, you could just write it down like that. Okay, so now we're all set. I'm gonna turn the unit on, get the line temperatures for the suction and the discharge. And from that, we'll be able to use these little formulas to get our superheat and subcooling readings. And one last thing I wanna do actually before I turn the unit on is purge the hoses. So whenever I put these hoses on, these hoses have a little bit of air in them and air is bad for the refrigeration system. So I just like to crack my hoses open just slightly to purge any of the air or any air bubbles inside of the hose out. So that one has been purged and on the high side, just like that. Because when the unit turns on, the suction side is actually gonna suck this refrigerant back into the system. So if there's air bubbles in here, it's gonna suck all that air back into the system and that's not a good thing. That's why you wanna purge them. But anyway, let's get back to turning this unit on and getting our superheat and subcooling readings. Okay, so the unit turned on, and as you can see, the low side went down, because this is the suction side, hence it's called the low side, the pressure goes down on that, and the high side, the pressure goes up. So it went from 125 to about 150 PSI, and this one dropped down to almost 75 PSI. So you wanna have the unit run for a couple of minutes to let this temperature stabilize. Okay, so the unit has been running for about five to 10 minutes now, the pressures have stabilized. So now let's get our superheat reading, which is gonna be L minus G. So that's gonna be, this is kind of fluctuating back and forth and that's because of the metering device, but it goes up to about 48 degrees. So if we take that 48, which is gonna give us our line temperature minus the gauge temperature, which in our case on the green scale is gonna be about 40 degrees, that gives us eight degrees of superheat. So our line temperature minus the gauge gives us our superheat, which is eight degrees of superheat. And now I'm gonna go ahead and move my clamp over on the high side. And the clamp you wanna put just a couple inches away from the service valve. And that's a good spot to measure both the superheat and the subcooling. Okay, so now we gotta just give it a little bit of time for the temperature to stabilize on my meter. And the formula for the subcooling reading is gonna be gauge temperature minus line temperature. So our gauge temperature is gonna be about, about 82 degrees on the R22 scale, the green one. So 82 degrees minus 72 gives us 10 degrees of subcooling. And that is good. So our readings turned out to be eight degrees of superheat and 10 degrees of subcooling. 
And that is how you measure superheat and subcooling. I hope that made sense. If you have any other questions, please let me know in the comments below. Or if you have any suggestions, if you're a technician or some further tips, we would love to hear from you as well. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it helped you out. Don't forget to mash that like button on the way out and I'll see you next time. And if you're still here, this is how to do a backflip. As you're jumping, you wanna be already up in the air and then curl up and do the flip. One common mistake is that people start flipping right away, right when they jump and they don't curl up and they end up landing on their neck. So this is how you do it. And if you have glasses, you probably want to take those off. Let's try it again. There you go. I haven't done this in a long time, so it took me a few tries to regain it, but that's how you do it. Let's try a front flip this time. Ugh, I'm getting old. Let's try this again. Yeah.